Welcome to the Tech Money Podcast, where the worlds of technology and personal finance collide. Hosted by certified financial planner, speaker, blogger, and self-proclaimed personal finance nerd, Malcolm Etheridge. Each episode aims to make you just a little bit smarter about your money, all from the perspective of the tech professional. Without further delay, here's your host. Hey there, listeners. Malcolm here. And on today's show, we're talking equity compensation. More specifically, we're talking about restricted stock units and the importance of creating a plan for what to do with your shares prior to them vesting. I recently completed and published the Tech Money Guide to Restricted Stock Units, which, by the way, is available for download at the Tech Money homepage. And it's a guide designed to answer a lot of the more common questions that I receive personally and also see floating out there on the various social media channels that receive some, let's say, questionable answers sometimes. So the guide is not meant to serve as a be-all, end-all on the subject. I encourage people to do their own research specific to their individual circumstances, but it is meant to offer some guidance and rules of thumb types of answers that are not easily Googleable. That is, we went deeper than the surface level to provide readers with a set of rules they can't get anywhere else. So that's what we'll be doing today. My producer, Eric with an A here in the virtual studio has a copy of the guide in front of him. And I asked him to hit me with his best questions and I'll do my best to answer them in layman's terms um, so that folks can understand. So on that note, Eric, my good man, let's get to it. All right. Well, first of all, I appreciate you bringing me in to do this because I have no clue what this is all about. (laughs) You could not have picked a better person to have no clue what this guide is about than me. So you say that, but you've been here for so many of these guests (laughs) who I've talked equity with. I'm sure you could probably answer 25 percent of these questions yourself. Oh, you're so kind. (laughs) Okay, let's just start off with a baseline then. Why don't you tell us why you wrote the guide, who it's for, and what it's for? Yeah, so essentially it's for people who receive restricted stock units as part of their total compensation every year, right? That that requires you to be constantly developing and revisiting your plan as you'll Mm -hmm. be receiving additional shares each year. It's also written specifically for folks who work for publicly traded companies. That's important to note because those are treated differently from restricted stock from privately held companies. But we will be making a revised version for folks who work for startups. But since the majority of people working in tech have RSUs, we started there. Okay, that's fair enough. So what is a restricted stock unit and how does it work? Yeah, so the short of it is it is a type of compensation that a company provides to its employees in lieu of traditional wages, like a salary or bonus, right? So Mm -hmm. people typically conflate the word restricted stock with stock options. It's a little bit different from stock options, though, because stock options give employees the right to purchase shares at a set price, whereas RSUs are actual shares of stock that are awarded to employees on a specific date. Okay. All right. That, so that is quite a bit different. Yeah. Now, just because I've been with you for so long, I, I kind of know the answer to this next question I'm going to be asking kind of, but I want you to expand on it for myself and also the rest of the audience. Why is it important to own equity in the company that you work for? Yeah. So it's really important because it's one thing to watch the company you work for exceed its sales targets and grow its revenue year after year and have the big party on CNBC when they go to ring the bell, if your company goes public and all those kind of things. And they're based partly on your efforts, right? And and then it's different to also participate in that party, right? Everyone's being rewarded financially for their contributions to the overall success. That's a totally different scenario. Mm -hmm. And so this arrangement aligns your interests with those of the company because you want the company to succeed because your equity, your stake in the company will increase in value every time that it does. And so owning equity in your employer just offers you an opportunity to build long-term wealth for yourself if done right. You know, doesn't guarantee you any future financial success, but reading this guide hint, hint, and making smart decisions early on can help make a big difference in how much of an impact your equity has on your, your overall net worth down the line. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I, I, I like the subtlety of the, the hints there. <laughs> that was perfect. Well, let me ask you this because that, I mean, it sounds great, but are there any disadvantages to being paid this way? Yeah, there certainly are. I mean, you could own similar to owning stock in anything else, whether you work for the company or not, it could be worthless tomorrow. And that's the risk you take. And so there are some companies where equity is like a huge, dangerously high percentage of people's income. But for most people, like Twitter is one that I know for a fact, like the majority of employees or something like 50% of their, their total comp comes from equity each year. That's a little high. Um, I think a lot of times somewhere around like that 25, 30% mark is where people tend to hang. And then, you know, you go higher up the food chain to the executive ranks and they include something called performance shares that, that increases that percentage a little bit, Mm -hmm. but the importance of owning equity is also the double-edged sword that cuts the other way, right? So if you decide to take a portion of your income in the form of stock, it means you're at the mercy of the stock market. You're at the mercy of the performance of the company that you work for and so forth and so on. And so I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but one of the the key tenants in this guide is also helping you devise a plan for when to sell shares so that you actually have something to show for all of that hard work down the line and not get left holding the bag on stock that's not worth nearly as much as it was when you received it or not worth nearly as much as it was when you took the job, those kind of things. Well, I think your your Twitter example is perfect because not only are you at the, the mercy of what Twitter is doing, but also Elon yeah, <laughs> in, in a lot of cases, right? I mean, that, that's a whole other ball game, but I think you're right. It's the perfect example. Like you have zero control over what Elon Musk is going to tweet tomorrow, but he has a lot of control over what your shares will be worth tomorrow. And Absolutely. so, you know, recent market fluctuations is the word I'll use have kind of driven people to become a little bit obsessed with a little bit afraid of Mm -hmm. what's going to happen in relation to their equity. Because, you know, in 2020 and 2021, I couldn't get very many of our clients to sell any of the shares in the company that they work for, because it's just, it's a rocket ship to the moon and it just keeps going up and to the right and better days are ahead. And folks are like, you're crazy if you think I'm going to sell any of this. And now we find ourselves in what I consider to be more of a normal market cycle where everybody's like, oh crap, I got to figure out what to do with these shares. Like I can't just continue to let it ride because that next role might not be the one. And so that's also part of the reason that I wanted to create this and put it out there is to help people learn how to actually incorporate those shares into their overall financial plan and, and, have a plan for what to do with those shares well in advance of when they actually best. Mm -hmm. Tell me something that people often overlook about their restricted stock units. Uh, So a a common one, I think is the remaining, the remaining value of the shares that they still hold. So if you, uh, the forfeiture value is the word I was searching for. So a lot of job switching happening right now has been happening in the last two years or whatever inside mm-hmm. of COVID, right? And in doing so, a lot of times you'll leave on the table your uh, unvested shares. So if you work for a company that has a four-year vesting timetable to get all of your shares, you've been there for like a year and a half. That means you've got two and a half years worth of shares that haven't vested yet. That has some value to it. And yep. so when considering whether it makes sense to jump to the next opportunity, Because the salary they're offering is a little bit higher. The days off are a little bit, you know, you got a few more days off or whatever. It's also important to factor into that, that calculation, what you're leaving on the table in the form of unvested shares and the forfeiture value of those unvested shares. Because sometimes it's the case that if you just waited another month, two months, whatever, there's a significant piece that comes available that now you get to walk away with instead of forfeiting that I don't think people necessarily factor all the way into the, into the conversation. And then also some companies will offer what's known as a buyout grant where they agree to buy out a candidate's unvested RSUs as, as part of their offer. And some companies don't offer this, but some do. And so it's important just to be well-informed when negotiating a compensation package with a potential new employer. But one of the ways that you start to be informed about that 
is by even knowing what your shares forfeiture value is in the first place. So another plug here, you, you mentioned my subtlety. There is actually a example in the guide that shows people how to calculate that forfeiture value. Mm-hmm. It's very simple, but that's important. That's an important number to know. Yeah. What other common mistakes do people need to be aware of in this situation? Yeah. So another very common one is misreporting the transactions. Like if you're to sell shares, misreporting the sale transaction, mm-hmm. and you end up being double taxed, right? There's again, an example of this in the guide so that folks who are visual learners can see exactly what I'm talking about. But essentially, if you sell shares, you get a 1099 from your employer. The 1099 is pretty much blank. It reports only the information that they are legally required to report, which is very Spartan. And then it's up to you to actually file the corresponding tax forms to make sure that it gets recorded properly. Not a common thing that people talk about all that much. Like if I was to say to you, like, you got to make sure you file a form 8949 to reconcile what was reported on your 1099B with it, you know, the accurate cost basis from your your records. You're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about, Mo? Mm-hmm. But that is something that if you are a person who prepares your taxes yourself, you need to be very much aware of because it's a very common thing that when we bring in a new client, we review the last couple of years of, of all of our new clients' tax returns. And one of the things that we're looking for is, did you appropriately reconcile the number of shares you sold, the taxes you had withheld, your basis in those shares? And I'd say one out of every two times, somebody has been double taxed because they just took the information wow. from the 1099, didn't go any further than that because they probably didn't know to. And there, there it is. And one of the things that folks are always asking is like, how can I make sure that I'm not paying the IRS too much? Or how can I reduce the amount that I'm paying Mm -hmm. in taxes every year? Well, this is one of the things. If you if you know what to be looking for, you can make sure that you're not accidentally uh, getting double taxed uh, on those shares whenever you do sell. Yeah. Well, you can't blame me because you're the one that opened up the tax can of worms here. So (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to I got to follow up. I, I know that it's a big part of what people need to know about managing their shares. What else should people know about taxes when it comes to their RSUs? Yeah. So another really big one is the automatic withholding rules tend to confuse people a bit, right? The mistake they make is not selling enough shares to cover the difference between their marginal tax rate and the 22% automatic withholding rate. And I'm I'm talking about a lot of math on a podcast. I recognize Mm -hmm. that. So I'm trying to to kind of hold it back and simplify it as much as I can. But what basically what I'm describing is the reason that a lot of folks who are paid in RSUs tend to end up with a surprise tax bill every year in April, right? And I'm using surprise in air quotes and facetiously because if it happens every year in April, it can't really be that much of a surprise, Mm -hmm. but it keeps growing and growing. And that's the part that surprises people because currently the federal supplemental wage rate as they call it, it's 22%. But most people who listen to this podcast and are clients of my, the financial planning firm that I work at and, and, and anywhere else are not in that bracket. They're in one of the ones above it, 24, 32, 35, 37. And that difference in what you're having automatically withheld from your shares of that vest and what you're due to pay the IRS in income tax at the end of the year is what's creating that surprise tax bill for most people. And so one of the key tenants in this guide is helping people understand, uh, distill down to the number of shares that they need to be selling on an annual basis by the year, by the end of the year to cover that difference in taxes from what was automatically withheld by your employer. And then what you actually owe because your own marginal tax rate is higher than that automatic withholding rate. And so that's another one of those that's very common, very big problem. I included this. I mean, it's an entire page and a half, I think, of the guide specifically focused on this to help people understand how to square that calculation and make sure that they're uh, not ending up surprised like once the 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 year is out. Yeah. Well, that, that leads me to just remembering the the number of times that you've spoken about shares specifically on the show. And you've said it's not a good idea to hold on to all your shares. And Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a good idea to sell all your shares either, obviously. 
How do you find the happy median? How, how do you know where that See, is? I, t- I told you you've been listening to me. You, oh, you, yeah. You, I'm yeah. learning. This is, <laughs> love it. Yeah. Uh, it depends is the answer. And I know that answer drives people crazy, but <laughs> the reality is that's the answer. It depends. Like the most conservative thing to do is sell them as soon as they vest and take that bird in the hand and know exactly what you're going to get. But most people, especially not most people who consume content through podcasts, right? I'm going to assume they skew a little bit younger. They're just not that conservative, especially folks who work in tech. Folks who work in tech are usually pretty risk on. And so I always encourage folks to at least sell enough shares to cover that that tax gap that I just m- mentioned from your mm-hmm. from the automatic withholding to your own marginal rate. But in addition, it helps to also make sure you're not paying more in taxes on shares that are no longer worth as much as they were when they vested. I'm glad you brought that up because you just made me backtrack something else I was thinking about. Another thing that's not Googleable, and I, I, I take pride in that because I like that this thing goes a little bit deeper than just Googling and seeing you mm-hmm. know what everybody else is saying. But one of the things that people are realizing now or realized in 2021 is that it's actually possible to lose money on RSUs if they vest and then you don't have the appropriate amount of taxes withheld because you didn't sell any shares. So then you turned around and paid the taxes for those shares using cash out of your pocket to pay the IRS. Mm. Now you're holding shares that are worth less than they were at the time their fair market value was recorded and you paid taxes. So you actually lost money because you paid more in taxes than the shares were actually worth. So that's another little nugget that I wanted to make sure that I, I remembered to get in there. So now I'll answer the the question that you were asking. And it's the the reason it depends is because you and I don't live the same life, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're a little bit further along in that your daughter is a grown adult who's financially responsible for herself, right? I'm, I'm going to throw your, your personal situation out there and match it against mine. My daughter, on the other hand, is a tiny little person who doesn't have a job and, and is learning how to read. Right. And so I'm still very much financially responsible for her. So it's important to me to put money away to save for her college education. That may not be of interest to you, right? Your, your, your daughter's already a grown adult person where you might say it's important to me to put enough money away to help my daughter buy her first house. Right. Uh-huh. It's something that I know is important to you. Whereas I might say, forget her. She's on her own. By the time I've paid for college and and everything else, she better be able to afford her own house and and she's her own financial backer at that point. Right. And so your needs are different from my needs. But the way that I square this is to tell people to actually sit down and write out what their financial priorities are and then assign a dollar figure to them. Right. So I have in the the guide a few generic questions that are a little bit more broad and cover a lot of people like have already saved a significant cushion for an emergency that applies to most people, right? Mm -hmm. That's a box you want to check. Am I on pace to contribute the maximum allowable to any of my tax advantage accounts that I participate in at my employer, like a 401k or HSA or ESPP, all those kind of things Mm -hmm. that applies to most people who work in tech. Uh, Do I have any financial goals that are non-negotiable? like saving for retirement, sending my child to college or making a major purchase. Again, kind of broad applies to a lot of people, but like once you've answered these questions for yourself, you want to assign a a dollar figure to them because that will also tell you the corresponding number of shares you need to sell to fund those goals each year and check that box to make sure that thing actually gets done, right? So if I'm saying to you, it's important to me to send my kid to to college debt free, right? And I know that the average college education outside of uh, outside outside of a state school is something like forty thousand dollars. I'll say I'm just throwing a number out there. And so four years at forty thousand dollars is going to be one hundred sixty thousand dollars that I need to have saved in today's dollars. So now I'm going to inflate that a little bit and say it's $200,000 by the time my kid gets there and it's time for her to go off to school, right? Yeah. So if I'm now trying to save $200,000 over the next 10 years, then I know I need to be selling $20,000 worth of shares every single year to fund that goal. Well, now I've identified the goal, I've assigned a dollar value to it, and I just have to now figure out every single year, I guess each quarter or semi-annually, whenever those shares vest, how many shares do I need to be selling at each interval 
to fund that 529 plan or wherever I'm saving for the, the college to make sure that that box gets checked and that goal gets accomplished. The remainder of the shares, I don't have a reason to be selling because I don't have any other financial goals I'm trying to solve. And so those I will allow to continue to accumulate in my brokerage account and continue to grow in the market, hopefully, right? Presumably they grow over time. I'll allow those shares to continue to grow until I have some other cash need. But now I've identified and created for myself a plan for how and when to sell shares, right? I got to cover my taxes. I'm going to contribute to the 529 and everything else. I'm just going to continue to let it ride. Okay. Well, that, that that's interesting because I've, I've heard you say many, many times, the receiving equity as part of your comp as a way to build wealth long term. Mm -hmm. So now we have to strike that balance, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a specific dollar amount or number of shares that you shouldn't sell beyond or else you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot? Yeah. So uh, it, it, it depends. There we go. There it is. Um, <laughs> as much as I hate giving that answer to people, that's the reality is it yeah. really just depends. But the reason I say that again is because I have worked with people that have said, I'm not going to sell below half of the number of shares that I have, no matter what. It's important to me to build a, a stake in Apple, let's say, as an example, in my portfolio. I want to own Apple stock for the rest of my life. So it's important to me that I don't sell more than half of my Apple shares as a way to, to do that. OK, if that's what your plan is, we figure out a way to work around it. Right. Or you might be a person who says, I want to own all of them forever because I believe this company over the next 30 years is going to be the next Amazon. I'm just throwing an example out there. And so I want to own as many shares of Amazon as I possibly can. Well, just be aware of the trade off you're making right now. You're pulling cash out of your pocket to pay taxes. You're pulling cash out of your pocket to fund all those other financial goals that you know, you've know thrown out there and, and identified and uh, assigned a dollar value to. And so now it's up to you, the financial risk of whatever that does turn out to be or not be. And so the way I always answer this question to people is you want to make sure that the number of shares you're hanging on to are not enough to wreck your financial situation. Like you want to be taking on enough financial risk in owning these shares that if it was to evaporate tomorrow and go to zero, it's not going to derail your ability to do all the other things that mm. are on your list of financial priorities. If that is the case, then we need to dial it back, right? Like if you are so fortunate that you've got enough in cash in the bank or your investment portfolio or whatever, that these shares going to zero tomorrow won't change a thing. Boom. There you go. There's your answer. Like yeah. there's nothing else for me to to, to say, but then since that's not most people, it's important to just like understand the trade off that you're making by saying, I'm going to hang on to these shares, right? Because if the example I use all the time is if your boss were to hand you $250,000 in cash today, you're not going to log into your brokerage account and use it to buy $250,000 worth of Apple stock if you're an Apple employee, right? You're just not going to do it. People don't work that way. But by deciding not to sell anything and staying fully invested after they vest, you're basically making that decision, whether consciously or unconsciously, right? So you do want to have some balance in there where you identify what you're using the shares to do. But there's also no right answer as far as what's the number to sell all the way down to. It's really a personal preference and a personal belief and all that kind of stuff. Well, I could be wrong, but I think that this message would have been great for Enron folks. I mean, Enron folks are what I'm basing this on, right? Mm -hmm. Or not even like Enron's kind of an extreme example. It's a little bit outdated. And so when we say it, people younger than you and I might even be like, what <laughs> are the you hell calling are you me talking? old? Like, Seriously? I'm calling us both old. Okay. Dude. Um, <laughs> but like, I'm looking at what happened in 2021 with a lot of companies that were Mm -hmm. companies that had inflated values just because that's where the market was at the time. And so uh, because the shares were, were valued at $500 a share at the time, everybody's excited and we love it. And we look at that and we, we're starting to make our, our life plans around that. Coinbase is a really good example of this that comes to mind as I'm talking. Like the share value is basically tied to, we now know, 
the, the price of those shares was directly tied to the market for crypto. So as soon as the market for crypto starts to cool, all of a sudden there goes the value of shares in Coinbase. But at a moment, Coinbase feels great, looks great, and it's going to the moon. And we're not really thinking about the opposite side, the fact that this sword cuts both ways and could crush us if we're yeah. making financial plans based around the share price of a company as volatile as Coinbase is because it's tied to something as volatile as crypto is. And so mm -hmm. I say that to say like Enron, we all want to look at it and say, that's an outlier. It's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. It won't ever happen again. Well, then how do you explain Lehman Brothers? Yeah. And then yeah. if you tell me Lehman Brothers was also an outlier and a once in a lifetime thing, I'll ask you, well, how do you explain Coinbase? And if you tell me Coinbase was a once in a lifetime thing, I'll ask you, how do you explain Robinhood, which had the similar trajectory as what I just explained mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. And so the point in this is just that these things will continue to happen. So it's just really important to make sure that like you set a plan well in advance of when these things, when, when these shares are going to vest and become available to you so that no matter what happens through the course of the year, one you're able to take the emotions out of your decision making a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. If we pre-planned it, like for our clients who who are executive level folks who are privy to non-public information, they're on a prescriptive selling plan, a 10B51 plan that designs exactly when they're going to sell well ahead of time. And there's no emotion in it whatsoever because they can't. And this also allows folks who don't have those same restrictions, but want to have a similar outcome to create a plan for themselves to remove the emotion from it so that no matter what happens from point to point in the market, you've got something to show for all of your hard work. And you're also able to help like save yourself from yourself. Take the human out of it is the way that I like to say it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, before we wrap up, I mean, we're getting close to the end of the podcast here. What is your main message to listeners who are paid via RSUs? And what's what's the big takeaway here? Yeah. I, so I've been kind of harping on it. I feel like I might be beating a dead horse to this point, but if folks have listened to this, uh, this point in the, the episode, then, then it means they want to hear what I have to say on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, the thing I would just reiterate or say differently is that in my experience, in my day job of working with folks who work in tech and receive restricted stock as part of their total comp, the folks who actually execute on the plan are the people who are most satisfied when it comes to having those shares or earning those shares. The people who actually do something with, with them when they vest are the people who are actually the most satisfied with everything, really. I was going to try and identify a specific thing, everything. They're, they just are happier about their shares. They're happier about their financial plan. They're happier about their situation with their employer their compensation package, all those kind of things, because they're not just watching numbers accumulate on the page for the sake of getting larger. They're actually using those dollars to execute a vision. And that's what really matters. And so people are just a lot more satisfied when they put a plan in place and then execute on that plan. All right. Fair enough. I mean, that sounds great. Malcolm, where can they get the guide? I mean, I'm going to do a call to action here as I do this close, but they need the guide. Where do they get it? Yeah. So we'll make sure that we have a copy of it, a link to it in the show notes for sure. Perfect. Also just the, the tech money homepage, tech-money.com. It's the very first thing at the top of the homepage now that folks can click into and download it as well. All right. Sounds good. Let's get back on track. Let's get some guests in here. People don't want to hear me. All right, let's, let's do this. <laughs> you right. say that, but you've got like that perfect broadcaster voice that, you know, you could be selling, I don't know, Toyota Camrys or, or <laughs> something like that in the middle of football games. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Toyota Camry could have gone with something a little bit more luxurious. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> Malcolm, thank you for your time, man. Thank you for letting me be a part of this because I do learn. I do listen. And, and this is this has been a lot of fun. And of course, our last thank you always goes to you, listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Tech Money Podcast with Malcolm Etheridge. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Malcolm comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. We humbly ask that you share this podcast and leave a review as this does actually help other people find the show. You can connect with Malcolm on social at Malcolm on Money. We'd love to hear from you and answer any questions you have. And you can do so by emailing them to podcast at tech-money.com. <laughs> 
Thanks again for listening today. For everyone at Tech Money, our hope is that this show helped make you a little smarter about your money. This has been the Tech Money Podcast. For more information on today's topic, to review the show notes, or to catch up on past episodes, be sure to check out malcolmetheridge.com slash podcast. And if you have an idea for a show topic that you'd like us to cover, or you want to send us feedback, the web address again is malcolmetheridge.com. You can also find Malcolm across all social media platforms at Malcolm on Money. This episode was written and created by Malcolm Etheridge, with the production, the editing and sound controls powered by Proudmouth. This has been a Malcolm on Money original. Thank you for listening. The information shared in this recording and by its guests represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not represent the views or opinions of the host. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. This content is not, nor is it intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. It is always recommended that you seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your personal financial situation.